It's wonderful to have such a large crowd. Somebody must have told you we're having cake. <laughs> but it's really special to have all of you here today because it's a very special day for me as well. Just wanted to add a footnote from last Sunday's sermon in which I mentioned Fanny Crosby, the woman who wrote 8,000 hymns. I misstated later on in the sermon that I said it was only 800, but it really was 8,000. And we sang two of them, um, Blessed Assurance. What was the other one, Joyce? <laughs> to God be the glory. Yeah. So the only reason I even knew about Fanny Crosby was I knew they were having a celebration of her life up in Brewster last Sunday. And so Janet actually went to that celebration on Sunday afternoon and picked up a, a program for the service. And get, guess which two hymns they sang. <laughs> yes, you're right. Blessed assurance. And to, imagine out of 8,000 that we picked the same ones they picked. So there's something going on in the water around here. I'm not sure. But I want to talk with you today about this gospel lesson. And there's so many, many lessons sort of embedded in this gospel lesson. I only want to pick out one, and it's the very last sentence. You cannot serve God and wealth. It does not say you can't be wealthy and serve God. What it says is you can't serve God and wealth, and there's a big difference because there are still lots of ways to serve God that don't require you to give up your wealth. So Jesus isn't saying that when he says this last sentence in the gospel lesson. But what he is saying is this. As the old King James version of the Bible, which many of us grew up with, ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now mammon is one of those funny little words that comes from the Aramaic that we often just kind of skim over without thinking about what it, what it means. But... It is really an Aramaic word, and Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke. So he probably did say, ye cannot serve God and mammon. But this word mammon really means something different than just wealth. It has a very negative connotation in the Aramaic language. It means sort of like gluttony or excessive materialism or greed or unjustly gain. So it really fits here that you can't serve God and those types of activities at the same time. But the idea here is not so much about how much you have, but more about how much attention or devotion you give to it that distracts you from the more eternal riches. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. You won't find much of Aramaic uh, in the Bible. But every once in a while, a word crops up, like mammon. Another place that you see it is when, when Jesus was on the cross. You've heard these words in our Good Friday and Easter services. Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've all heard that when we've been in Christian churches. So that question by Jesus from the cross, when we look at it in the context of Jesus' life, is really an astonishingly, astonishingly painful question. But it's also one that really relates directly today to our lesson about our inability to serve both God and wealth. So let's explore that just a little bit. Some of the confessions of faith of different denominations in our Christian church emphasize that we are God's and not our own. For example, in the Presbyterian Church, their doctrine of faith that was enacted in 1983 starts off this way. It says, in life and in death, we belong to God. And no one understood this reality more personally than Jesus did. And Jesus, as we know, is declared by the church to be both fully human 
and fully divine. So Jesus knew in his heart what he wants us also to know, which is that we, like he, are gods. We belong to God. That's really what makes his cry from the cross so traumatizing in a way and so stark. In his human nature, Jesus came to understand on that day at that time the feeling of being so alone that it was as if God had really walked away and disowned him. It's a feeling that could come to Jesus and also can come to us only when we deeply grasp the reality that in life and in death we belong only to God and cannot serve both God and something or someone else. If we have no sense of that, or if we disavow it or disbelieve it, or if we reject that truth, we can't really fully feel anger or outrage or sadness or hurt when we experience God's absence, just like Jesus experienced God's absence on the cross. I think there are very few of us, perhaps not any of us, that can deny that we have at some point or another in our lives felt God's absence. And yet it's precisely at those times, at such times, and maybe mostly at those times, that hope is even possible. Hope comes alive only in the dreary silence or absence of God in our loneliness before a heaven that feels closed to us. That is where human beings expressed most fully our hope that God's silence is neither basic nor final nor permanent for us, nor is it a cancellation of what we know and originally have hold, held on to as God's word. This sense of abandonment that most of us has felt at some time or another is really itself a sign of hope because we cannot feel abandoned by someone with whom we don't have a loving relationship. Betrayal and abandonment presume love. They presume the existence of love between two human beings. In fact, it sometimes feels as if, as if love itself has been betrayed and abandoned when we have that feeling in our gut. So when we're angry at God, it's a sign that we understand this last sentence in the Luke passage today, the lesson that we cannot serve both God and something or someone else. If we choose to serve God because God first chose to love us, then we have no other master. We either belong to God totally and altogether or not at all. This idea of belonging to God is a vertical relationship, a vertical arrangement. It's different from any of the earthly horizontal relationships that we have with other people in our lives. For instance, throughout much of human history, right up until today, even in some parts of the world, some people have been enslaved. We know that in our country, before the end of the Civil War, for instance, many white people literally owned some black people, and they had been enslaved. And they did so quite legally. It was not even questioned that much. But there was nothing in that morally repugnant slave relationship that remotely resembled what we mean now when we say that we belong to God and that God owns us. For one thing, unlike true slaves, we are always free to reject God, to walk away, to sever the relationship, either temporarily or permanently. And although when that happens, it breaks God's heart, 
God will, and always does, respect that decision because it is truly a relationship of love and free will. So whether in the ultimate scheme of things, God allows that rejection for eternity is something we really can't know for certain. But I believe, and I think most of us in our Christian faith believe, that God does not allow the severing of that relationship for eternity. Another example of this horizontal type of love or horizontal type of belonging is a relationship between parents and children. We all know as parents that if things work out right and the way we plan, their children will ultimately become independent. Unfortunately, for some of you who may be like me, you get a text every so often from someone needing money and it happens to be one of your kids. So that severing of the relationship takes many steps, sometimes forward and then backward, but the ultimate goal, of course, is independence <clears throat> and free will without a severing of the relationship. Human love sets people free. It doesn't bind them to a will that's not their own. In fact, the best and maybe the only perfect model for understanding that belonging to, or that relationship of belonging to, is to look to Jesus. We are not, and we cannot be, God incarnate. We can only mimic the love that Jesus had for his Father and the bond that existed there. But we can look at the way Jesus always and everywhere sought to join his will with the will of the one he called Abba, Father. When he's with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane and he leaves them to pray alone, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Can you and I get into the habit of saying that every time in every situation that confronts us? Can we get in the habit of saying, yet not what I want, God, but what you want? It is a difficult habit to get into, but once you get into it and fully envelop it, it's a difficult habit to leave. And the things that really matter in our life, we already know what God wants. God wants us to love one another, to show mercy and compassion to the needy, as was stated in the psalm today, and to be generous because God has been uniquely generous to us. And we need to show gratitude and care about justice. God wants our hearts to break whatever breaks God's heart. And God wants us to tell others about the belonging that we have with God and that we feel with God through Christ. The belonging of knowing that in life and death, our hearts are actually joined with the heart of God to serve only God. Returning to our original part of the gospel today, you can't serve both God and riches. We give our lives to the things that God wants, and our riches come in far de deeper ways. This need not cause us misery, rather it is to see the light in the eyes of those whom we nour nourish, and to see the joy in the faces of those that we serve, and those that need us when we are able to supply that need. Our efforts are always met with a tenfold return. Today I want to do something a little different and special. I wanted to recognize in a way some of the deeper ways that we have been blessed here at St. Luke's over this past year with forming all new relationships with each other 
and with the community around us. We have a lot of people here today that were not a part of this congregation a year ago, and I've asked their permission to recognize them and ask them to come forward because I think it will help us feel and understand the unity and the ties that we as believing Christians feel. And I also think it will help us understand and get a taste of that unique relationship of our oneness with God and our ability to see God in the people around us. So I, I have a little bit of a feeling that I ought to start with the guys in the second row. <laughs> not, not that we don't want you here, but I just want you to, if you feel like you need to leave, you can. So one of, if, if you guys don't mind being first, could you come up and let me, I want everybody to see the new faces and know the names that go with those faces. So, so we have Corinne, Curtis, and Curtis. Now, little Curtis is going to be baptized in two weeks. And I, I, have, I also have a feeling that those blue eyes are going to be fixed on every single person when, when we go through and introduce little Curtis to, to all of you. So thank you guys for being here. It's a pleasure to have, us, to have you here with us in this congregation. We look forward to many years and decades of you being here. So do you guys mind staying up here for a few minutes? Oh, sure. All right, so if, if little Curtis gets upset, you guys, <laughs> you guys can do whatever you feel like you need to do. Um, and, and, it's, and it's really, it's really gratifying to me that all of you were willing to come here today on a beautiful day when you could have been doing something else, to come here and share in this experience of my first anniversary as your pastor. So thank you all for doing that. All right, now, I, I, don't anybody get embarrassed, okay? Just, it, if all of you would come forward when I say, Viran and Ruvan, could you guys come up? I knew Viran and Ruvan at St. Mark's in Mount Kisco when I was there for a couple of years. And they're very faithful, have been very faithful parishioners there. You guys can, you don't have to climb the stairs. Why don't you stay right down there, Vera, and that way you don't have to come up the steps, okay? So turn around so everybody can see your beautiful face. You, you've never seen a smile like this one. So I just wanted you guys to see, see the smiles on, on their faces today. Angela, would you mind coming up? Where'd Angela go? There you are. Now, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I can lay claim to Angela coming since I've been here, but she was coming around the time that I got here. So we're, so we're, we're going to include Angela as Angela Gar as, as a, quote, new parishioner. Uh, Bob and Barbara, where, where are you? I know I saw you. Come, yeah. As they say, what's, what's the show? Price is right. Come on down. Um, Linda. Can you come down? Linda McGrath. So most of you guys already know Linda and, and you already know Angela and you already know Bob and Barbara, but there's some, there's some that, that are, are not here as often as others, so I just want to be sure that everybody recognized uh, who was here. Stephanie, can you come up? Stephanie Keegan. And Stephanie came to my office several months back and we had a wonderful talk about what's going on in her life. And Stephanie travels a lot to do lobbying work, so she's not able to be with us as much as she would like to or as much as we would like for her to, but she's a lovely person, and I hope you'll get a chance to, um, to meet her. Amanda and Ryan and little Zach. Yeah, Amanda and Ryan. And little Zach was, was baptized a few months back, and in fact, I think I have his picture right here on the piano, so it's lovely to have you guys here, and I think I'm about to lose my light. Thanks, guys. Carol and Ken Wagner. Carol and Ken are the only people that I have ever known that asked me to come and bless their home. And so when, when they came, shortly after they came, they <laughs> came by one day and, I, and took me to their home. And we went from room to room and room and did a little liturgy of, 
a blessing of the home, and it was wonderful for me to spend time with them and, and be in their company. Katie and Patty and Bob, could you guys come up? Now, there's one thing I really love about the Catholic faith, and that is that it runs people off sometimes. And, and so when, when that happens, the most likely match is an Episcopal church. So, you know, we, we, we have the good fortune of, of, having, of having the Catholic church having run Katie and Patty and Bob off for us. So, so thank you all. Al and Priscilla. Can you, Alan, yeah, come on up, guys. Um, Alan and Priscilla have been, have been coming, I don't want to call them new, but you've been coming for what, several months? What you coming? Yeah, Four. okay. Well, you've been coming a lot lately, so we'll do that, we'll call it that. So, and, and they were, Alan and Priscilla were like, they would kind of come in and sit in the very back corner and try to get out real quick. And so I didn't know their names very much for the first few times that they were here, so I finally made them write their names down for me so I could, I could um, you know, be able to see them. Um, and, and Carol and Katie and Rick, could you guys come up? Now, Katie has been coming here pretty much since she was a little girl, but recently has come back more frequently. She helps in the thrift shop. And Carol and Rick have been joining her lately, so we're so happy that they're here grace, gracing us with their presence and being, being a part of our congregation. Ira and Evelyn Weissman, can you guys come up? Now, the Catholic Church didn't run them off. <laughs> um, but upstate New York did run them off. And, and so they came down here to be near their family so I understand they're, being, they're giving free babysitting services a lot lately. <laughs> so we're just happy to have them with us. Uh, Graham Ashton, as you know, was, is, has been here pretty much uh, the last several Sundays. He's not with us today. He couldn't be here, but he has also uh, become one of our new parishioners. Um, I think Samuel and Nazarene, there we are. Come on, come on up. Samuel and Nazarene have been joining us for the last couple of months and we're so happy to have them as part of the congregation. They are devout Episcopalians and just happy to have them among us. Um, Jackie Peters is not here today, is she? Okay. Um, there's a couple other people that I want to mention that have not actually said they want to become a part of our congregation but have been here from time to time and I love them both dearly. One of them is Merrill Hayes in the red, and one of them is Karen Kelly in the purple. Friends of mine from past parishes that, that um, love to be a part of a nice worship service with a heavy spirit going on, and I really think that um, we want to extend our hospitality to them. Now, I can't say I would love to have them as parishioners because the bishop would really kill me if I did that <laughs> and tried to, tried to pull them away from somewhere else, but. We do love having you guys here and with us in our worship service, and you add a lot of joy when you're around, so thank you. Um, let me see. I think that's everyone. Yeah. Yeah, Carolyn. I think that's everyone. So let's give just a warm welcome to all, to all of these folks. Thank you guys I just want to, I want to say one more thing about you guys. I'll say more downstairs later when we cut the cake, but um, there is a spirit in this congregation that you feel when you come in the door. Um, and it's, it's a spirit that I think is attributable to the hospitality and to the kindness and to the welcome and the generosity that all of you have. None of these people standing up here today would be here if it weren't for that spirit that is contributed to by all of you, by the choir and the beautiful music that we have, and by the welcome that you give. And that is a welcome that is not an artificial welcome, and it's not a pushy welcome. It's not in your face, come be part of us, we need your money, or whatever. <laughs> it is, we love having you here, we enjoy your presence, and we want to be here as part of your family 
for whenever the times come that you need us or we need each other. So that's why we're all here, and I, I hope that all of you will get to know each other better if you can come to coffee hour downstairs, and um, we really do welcome you all. Thanks, guys. Thank I'm going to end the sermon with a prayer, so the Lord be with you. Almighty God, look with favor upon these, your servants, who have now joined their voices with ours to become a part of this community, to serve in your name alongside all of your saints and all of our blessed brothers and sisters, past and present. Give them courage, patience, wisdom, and vision and strengthen us all in our Christian vocation of witness to the world and of service to others. Let us join together in our mission of making known to our community and to the world the love you demonstrate to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God.